All right. Reel it in. Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. We're going to get started here. Cool. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Yes. Super excited about this chapter. So great. Yes. Moving into good stuff here. Honestly, it, I don't know. For me, it's all been good. I've been like super blessed by it. But I know, right? So good. So um, today we're going to talk about controlling your own body because Paul has been on the subject. I, oh, yes. Yeah, here. Yes. Good job, Daphne. Daphne's got this down. Don't worry. If Paul was writing you a letter, he would say, keep moving forward, Daphne. Yeah. That's what Paul has been talking about. Okay. He's going to talk about controlling your own body. But, but this whole subject has been leading to here in moving forward because he's just commended like, okay, uh, Thessalonians, you guys have done a great job in moving into what the Lord has for you, but don't stop there. Keep moving forward. We've been talking about that idea of continuing on in our faith. Once we have our faith, that's fantastic and it's amazing. It's this miracle experience, but where do we go from here? How do we continue to move forward? What does this look like tangibly in all of our lives? Because we have all these verses that say that they will know us by our love and let your light shine before others and faith without works is dead. So how does that uh, correspond with a salvation that is just an act of faith? Simple act of faith, you have salvation, but then you have these verses that say, oh no, there's, there's something more to be done in you. And it could be difficult, especially for newer Christians, to find this cohesiveness in Scripture in what this all looks like. Because these verses tend to look like uh, they go against each other, and they don't. They correspond with each other and how our lives are supposed to progress after we become. It's timing. The whole thing is timing. Yes, you have your salvation, but then what happens? Because if we're still here, we're not dead yet. God is still doing the work in and through us, through us for other people and in us for ourselves and who he wants us to be, that sanctification process that we talked about last week. So he desires to purify your life and bring joy in it and take you out of the old things into these new things that he has for you. He's doing this new work because he still has purpose for you. And that purpose isn't just to set you on the sidelines, but to get you actively involved in what he's doing. It's not for all of us to say, okay, we're Christians now. We could just go sit and enjoy the beach and wait for God to come back. No, he has something else for you. He has a work for you that he's already doing and he's preparing you for that place, each one of us. So he wants to get us all actively involved in that. Um, and I think, the reason this has to change is because if we as Christians get saved and then jump right back into the same life we were living before, then how does it draw anybody else to him? That makes no sense, right? Anybody would look at you and say, okay, well, they say they're saved, but they're living the same life that they were living before. So why do I need to do this? I'm living the same life as them. I'm as good as them. You hear that out of people. I'm a good person, so I'm going to heaven. Know that there's, there's something different that God wants to continue to do and work in you. The point of coming to know Jesus is that everything in your life will change and progress in him. Not that we do this work on our own because it's not of us, it's of him and the Holy Spirit in us, but that we allow him to do this work and to move forward in our lives. That we would truly come from death to life from old to new, and all these things would be changed. The, you, would, you would go from having no purpose for your life to having a brand new purpose and a plan for your life that God has for each one of us. So these verses would ring true um, um, in all of us. That's what God is trying to do. He's trying to make these, uh, uh, faith without works is dead. Let your light shine. He's trying to make these verses ring true in our lives by progressing us in them so that people would know us by our love so that um, uh, through your faith you would have these works and that your light would shine and God desires 
to do all this in each one of our lives. So we see this great work that God is doing and no matter how he has prepared us in each one of our lives to get to this point, he still wants to do a greater work, even greater than that in you, just like he's doing in these Thessalonians here. It's easy to, once you become a Christian, start to stagnate and you become like pond water. And that's not what he desires for each one of our life. He, he desires us to be like a rushing river that we would glow and move forward and, and to team with life and to support life. That's what he desires for each one of us. That's what he, if you notice in the Bible, God never refers to life as being like a pond. He never refers to it like that. It's always a river, the river of life. That's always how he refers to it because that is his plan, that's how he set this all up. It makes sense that we wouldn't be just festering around, but that we would a- actively be doing something. So let's read our scripture, and I want to read this whole section, starting in verse 1 and going through verse 6. We're going to spend a couple of weeks here just because there's so much here. Um, and, and really what God is doing in our lives and how he plans to do this. So uh, let's go ahead and read this. Starting in verse 1, it says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, excuse me, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one would transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. I find it very interesting that here in this room, I said, we're going to be talking about controlling your own body. And everybody looks to the food. <laughs> but Paul, Paul in this section of scripture, goes to sexual immorality. Immediately goes there. He could have picked a host of things. He could have picked food. Different things. Why does he choose sexual immorality to be the way that they're moving forward? The next step for them. Very interesting. Here Paul talks about our, sec- our sexuality and the reason being in my own mind is because out of all the things he could have chosen, I think there's multiple reasons that he chose sexuality and specifically sexual immorality to talk about in this section. Um, the biggest reason I believe is because sexuality is a representation of God in his fullness. When man and woman come together in a married relationship, you have the fullness of God and all his given attributes represented in that relationship, in the man and in the woman. Because he's given man a specific set of traits and attributes, and he's given woman a specific set of traits and attributes as well. None are less than the other because they're both attributes of God. All of them are attributes of God. And he's given them to us both so that when we come together, we would represent him in the way that he desired us to. That's why it's so important, this this married relationship between a man and a woman. That's why when we come together, we have this culmination of who God is and what he's set us out to be. Um, A man, a lot of times is this picture and of, of brute strength and um, this hard-nosed enforcer of, of justice and all, all things right. And that's his job to be the protector and the provider. And then in woman, you have this caring, nurturing, welcoming and uh, forgiving and forgetting um, uh, just, just lover that she is. And that's a representative of who God is. We see both of these things in the Bible. We see God act in that brute strength, in that justice, and we see him love and forgive and forget almost simultaneously at a lot of times, that he knows when to love 
and when to bring justice. And I think it's so beautiful for us to remember that we all represent God in that way. No matter what attributes he's given us, obviously this is not a blanket statement. It's not like, oh, men are always given these and women are always given these. No, whatever attributes he's given you to represent God and to be an ambassador to God in that way. Isaiah says that God doesn't remember our sins. He doesn't remember them. Just straight up does not remember them. And I know that this is fully represented, not in a man's, not in a man's brain, but in a woman's brain. And I'll tell you a story. Um, we have a cat named Alvin. Alvin, yep. That's, yep. We got him from, uh, we got him from uh, shelter, and that was already his God-given name, so we just kept it. Um, but this cat, we got him as just a, like a little kitten. He was like this big, and he was an absolute terror. Absolute terror. He, we had him in the house, of course, and he would run around. He would scratch up all the furniture and hang from the drapes. And when you walked by him, he attacked your legs and then ran off really quick. I mean, he was just a nightmare to have in the house. And so when he got big and started like looking outside and wanting to go out there, I mean, my first reaction was, boop, like, <laughs> see ya, outside you go. <laughs> Any excuse, I was just ready. But... You know, it only took about a week and Irene comes to me and she goes, honey, can we let him back inside? He's so cold out there. He just has nothing to do and he's so sad. He has no friends. He, he wants to come inside and be with us and be warm with the family. And my first reaction to this was, did you just forget the six months that happened previous to this in one week? We see that in women. We do. Because they just love, like, incredibly. They forgive incredibly in these ways and forget. And so we see both character traits represented in this story. The man serving justice and protecting his household and the woman having amnesia. So <clears throat> Alvin's still an outdoor guy. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about... <laughs> And I, I say that tongue in cheek because obviously God has that attribute. He just forgives and he forgets. Willingly forgives and forgets. So God, you could say, has amnesia. <laughs> but this is what we're talking about when we discuss sexual immorality because sexual immorality plagues a culture. And when we start to glorify it, it ultimately leads to a culture's demise as a whole because God doesn't honor it. God doesn't honor any type of sexual immorality. It's because it, realistically, it's not his plan. It's not his purpose for us. And if you know anything about God's plan, when you start to misrepresent God's plan, he doesn't take that lightly. And so he doesn't honor. I mean, if you think about uh, like Moses leading the children of Israel out of the desert, he was supposed to take them into the promised land. But what happens? He strikes the rock twice. And that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was for the Messiah, the rock, to be struck once and then to just be spoken to after that from there on out. So when Moses strikes the rock twice, he's messing with God's plan. And he's saying, you know what, Moses, I can't allow this to happen. I can't allow you to misrepresent me. Moses was a representative of God to the people. And God said, I can't allow it to happen. And that's the same thing that he does in these cultures, in our culture. God says, you're misrepresenting me in your life. The sexual immorality that's happening in our culture today is misrepresenting the plan and purpose of God and what he has for each one of us. A man and a woman represent God just in who we are. We don't have to do anything special. We don't have to be anything special. He created each one of us to be who we are. And we represent him in that way. We're a direct representation of him. It was God's plan to create us in his own image, to give us his attributes, to make us be who we are. So this story that I'm telling you with Moses is not to push you down and say, hey, look, um, 
if you just misrepresent God in just the littlest way, he's going to cast you out and not take you into the promised land. No, no, no. Moses did end up in the promised land because when um, Joshua goes up on the mountain, or no, no, I'm sorry. When Jesus goes up on the mountain, Moses is there. He sees Moses. So Moses gets into the promised land, but he gets into the promised land a different way through the Lord. He, God works out this plan for each one of us. We've all misrepresented God in our lives, each one of us. And if you're like me, that's like every single day. So don't get hung up on it, but know that God has a specific plan and purpose for each one of us. But this will plague a culture and lead to its ultimate demise because God won't allow his plan to be misrepresented. And you can see this all throughout history. You saw it through in the Roman Empire. Whenever sexual immorality is allowed, whenever the family unit is broken down and homosexuality and other types of sexual immorality are glorified, God won't honor that and ultimately the culture breaks apart because it's his plan and purpose. That's why I believe in this country, he's allowed us to prosper in such a way that we have because we were founded on his principles. We were founded on who he is. But now we're straying away from that. We're starting to do things differently. And it's too bad because people no longer fear God. People no, no longer understand. And they think that we're progressing humanity in this day and age by creating this, this uh, um, culture of homosexuality, of, tra- of transgender- dris- uh, tra- transgenderism. Transgenderism. Thank you. My tongue's like <laughs> sticking to the roof of my mouth today. Transgenderism. And um, all these different things, all these different types of sexual immorality that we're glorifying in this culture today, he's saying, no, this is not my design. This is not my plan. And even though we think we're moving it forward, we're actually going back in time because if, if the Romans were being judged for this, that was 2,000 years ago that the Romans were judged for this. So don't think that this is a new work. Like, oh, we're, we're progressing ourselves. We're evolving into a higher species. No, species don't evolve when they can't mate and reproduce. It doesn't work that way. So don't think that this is a good way to go. It's not a good way to go. The way to go is to stay with what God originally said. Just because he said it, it through his prophets a long time ago doesn't mean anything. That, all that means is that he had people then that he cared about and he has people now that he cares about. He cares about us all. And so he wants, to, wants us to have a plan. And please don't take me wrong when we talk about sexual immorality and I bring up homosexuality and I bring up transgenderism and these other things. Because realistically, in, in a normal orientation, we can have just as much sexual immorality in our lives as in those things. It doesn't change. The sin doesn't change. It's still a sin is a sin. So if you're sinning in a... a uh, in your life, in a normal orientation of sexuality, that doesn't make it any better than homosexuality. That doesn't make it any better than being transgender. You're still sinning against God and against his plan. He has this beautiful picture of what a married relationship is supposed to be like, that we're supposed to be this this great um, strength and this great representative of who God is in the fact that we come together and become one person. We become one. It says uh, in Genesis that a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And something, um, I don't know if I've told you guys this before, but I took a class um, one time and I can't even, I think it was like Conqueror's. Pat, you were there. Was it Conqueror series or something like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was. Conqueror series? Anyway, yeah, they were talking about this and something that really struck me. You know, you think all these pictures that God makes, like some of them are just figurative. One thing that they said is they they did an autopsy on a woman and they were doing an autopsy on the brain and they found the DNA of everyone she had ever been with in her brain cavity after she was dead. They found all her partner's DNA, or all her partner's, yeah, DNA, 
in her brain. Really? Absolutely. So you can see that God really means this literally. He says, no, you will become one flesh. You will be a part of one another. And so you see God's picture even brighter in that type of setting, right? That's amazing that God set it up like that. And you know what really, um, I got to tell you, it just breaks my heart what we have done to this culture and what we have allowed for this culture. I was talking to a guy about this yesterday or the day before. And just how, like if you, if you throw a, a frog into boiling water, he'll just jump out. But you start it cold, right? you know, those if you start it cold and then gradually turn it up, he'll just stay in there and boil himself to death. And I feel like that is what we've allowed Number one, as Christians in this culture, is it's just slowly progressed and progressed. No giant jumps, but just slowly progressed and progressed, and we've allowed it to happen and allowed it to happen. And we're light years from where we were 50, 60 years ago. We're not even close. Just look at our schools. Look at what they're teaching our little ones before they even have a chance to create their own thoughts. They're feeding this to them. And so it's our job to combat that by number one, starting in our own family. We talked about this. Starting with your own family. Starting with your own kids. It's a lie to think that the world is going to teach your kids what you want them to think. They're not going to. The world is not going to teach your kids about God. It's not going to teach your grandkids about God. It's our job. It's our job to teach them and to, and to pour into them and to live that life, to show them to walk that walk. You know, um, what really breaks my heart about all this is that it's all been done for free. You know, um, virginity and even sexuality is so precious. It's so beautiful when it's done right. But when it's done wrong, it's so wrong. And you feel it. If, if you ever have, have had a relationship, a sexual relationship outside of marriage, you know that at the beginning, it feels wrong. And then you start to sear your conscience more and more, and it starts to feel righter and righter. But that doesn't make it any righter and righter. You know it's wrong even still, but you just force that out. That's the same thing we've done here. You know, it's a holy bond that God has given us. It, it truly is. Any type of sexual relationship, as we just talked about, it's a holy bond that we have. As husband and wife, even if in, in uh, putting Christ first and having him surrounding your relationship, even if it's just a friendship, like that's a holy bond you share when Christ is a part of your relationship because that was his design. But now what we've done in, in getting back to this free thing is we've given away what is priceless for free. We've given away what is priceless for free. We have not charged anyone. And, and, and uh, again, nothing's new because this says in Ezekiel 16, um, it says that we've played the harlot and we've given away for free what prostitutes charge for. And so we're worse than prostitutes because we've given away for free and even enticed other people to come to us with gifts so that we could play with them. And man, you read that today and you're like, wow, this is, this is the culture, isn't it? This is exactly what our culture is doing. And, you know, it started at the top. It started in, uh, you know, a married relationship with a man and a woman. And then in one generation, it was easily passed down to the kids. And then the kids started having a sexual relationship out of wedlock. And then it just continues on from there and gets more and more perverse until somebody says, I often think about this because this really plagues my life, actually. I think about it all the time. How do you get from where we're at now to where we need to be? And let me tell you, it's just one person. It's one person that stands up and says, no, I'm going to do this right. And then another person says, you know what? I want to do it right, too. And then another person, and each of us, Saying, hey, giving your experience, especially if, if you've been in a relationship like that, like I have, to pass that on to the next generation and say, hey, look, I did it this way. You don't want to do it that way. Trust me. I've been there 
It's enticing on the outside, but it's like a balloon. It looks fun on the outside, but it pops quick and there's nothing there. It's our job to teach the next generation. It's our job to pour into them and to show them what's right and what's wrong and to allow them the knowledge to step into the Lord because the world is teaching them the knowledge that says, hey, look, you can do whatever you want, whoever you want to be, do that way, and that's love. What they don't realize is, no, you actually hate that person if you allow that to happen because that's going to lead them to emptiness and ultimately from a, 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 to a separation eternally from their Savior. What is really loving is to say, no, this is not right. We don't do this. Even if you feel that way, this is not who we are. This is not what we were created to be. Let's do things right. He will honor our culture. Everything. Because it's his plan. It's what he does. And, you know, I see this even with people that aren't Christians. When they do it right and they get married, before they start doing anything else, God honors that relationship. He may not be honoring other things in their life, but he honors their relationship because they did it his way. Even though they don't have a relationship with him, he's apparently put it enough on their heart and their parents put it enough on their heart to do things right to do things God's way. It always starts at the top and works its way down. That's important to keep your witness no matter where you're at in life. No matter if you're a parent, a grandparent, even a kid who's not even there yet. To keep your witness. Um, it's so important to step in to what God has for you and to trust in Him alone because He will maintain your witness. The witness is His. This is his story. This is his plan. This is his purpose for each one of us. So he will maintain that for us. He will do that great work in us. Not because it's our righteousness, because it's his righteousness that he's imparted to each one of us. He said, yeah, it's not you, but it's me. I've done the work. It is finished, he said on the cross. That work is done. So like I mentioned before, you don't have to roll around in it and stay in that pond and be like, oh, I've done this. I can't be God's representative. No, no, no. You can now because God has imparted his righteousness upon each one of us. He said to each one of us, no, it's not because of you and what you've done and what you've been through. It's because of me and what I've done and what I've been through for you, for your sake. You can stand on the promises of God because this is what happens, isn't it? We see the things that we've done in our life and then because of the shame of it, we refuse to tell anybody else what they should do with their life for fear that they might turn and say, well, what about you? What did you do? Right? Isn't that what goes through our head? Oh, I don't want someone to come back at me, so I probably shouldn't tell them how they should live their life. I understand. But it's God. It's God. It's His promise. It's when you stand on His promises, you stand on solid ground. You stand on a solid rock that can't be shaken. It doesn't matter who comes after it. It might be moved by the wind, but it ain't going to fall over because you're standing on him. And you can say, Paul says, I, I glory in my weaknesses that Christ may be glorified. That in him and through my weakness that he may be lifted up. That was his, that was his, um, um, his whole thought process is it's not about me anymore. It's about God and what he's done. It's about this beautiful thing that he's done in my life that I can now glory in my weaknesses. I can now say, hey, I've done things the wrong way, but that doesn't mean that you have to. I've been a bad person. I've done things I shouldn't have done, but that doesn't mean that you have to. We can glory in that weakness and what God's done in us. And we can tell that next generation, hey, God has something better for you. God has a better plan for you. I ruined it for myself. But you can continue to latch on to his promises and you can live a life that God's going to honor in every single way if you would just do it. That's the promise that he gives to each one of us, that it's not about us, but it's about him and what he's done. So God, we thank you for what you've done for each one of us. 
that it isn't about us, that it's all about you, God. It's all about you and what you've done. Thank you that you have set us free from our guilt and our shame. We no, have to, no longer have to worry about it. We no longer have to be concerned about who we've been and what we've done, but we can only be concerned about what you're gonna do in us, God, because you have a great and glorious plan for each one of us. You have a great, great plan for each one of us. And your desire is just that we would step in and not let those old things hold us back, God. Would you break the chains of those bondage, bondages of each one of our lives, God? Break those chains in every single way. And allow us held down in our sin and in our shame, but to step forward to your glorious light. To allow you To allow, but that people, how amazing you are. Because if you could do it in our lives, God, you could truly do it in anyone's life. In anyone's life. You say that you will not fail to complete that good work in us, God. You will see it through to the end until the day of Jesus Christ. And I can't wait. Can't wait for what you're going to do. And I thank you that you still have work for us to do here. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Awesome.